The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Today, Carl Strzok is here, longtime columnist at the uh, Gazette. He's written a book, From Deberg to Jerusalem. It has the subtitle of The Unlikely Rise and Awful Fall of a Small Town Newsman. It covers his whole career. He's going to be talking about that. So here's Carl. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's true. It's true. I've written, I've, I've written a book. Never thought I could do it, but I, but I did. People often told me. <clears throat> That I ought to collect my columns in a book, and I really couldn't see, I really couldn't see doing that. I, I thought people who who said it probably wouldn't buy it. Anyway, themselves. people sometimes suggest that I put my columns together in a collection. I didn't think it would work. I thought anybody who liked the columns had probably already read them. Why would they pay money to read them twice? Um, besides, um, my career, such as it was, was ongoing. I had no intention of uh, retiring, no intention of stopping. I thought a book ought to have an end. Ought to have a beginning, ought to have an end. And if I did a book like that, there wouldn't be a beginning, wouldn't be an end. And then uh, my wife, uh, Pearl, and I uh, took a trip. We'd been traveling a bit every year, uh, trying to spend down the vast wealth I had accumulated at the Gazette. We were making a major trip every year. We went to India, went to uh, Turkey. Uh, where else did we go? Went to Morocco. And uh, finally, we went to uh, Jerusalem. And the fallout from our uh, Jerusalem trip was not exactly what I anticipated and eventually led to my leaving, to my leaving the paper. And I said, well, uh, now I've got an end. If I wanted to write a book, I didn't plan on it, but I've, I've got an ending. And I thought back do I have a beginning? Was there a beginning to my uh, Gazette uh, career as a columnist, uh, such as it was? And the more I thought, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yes, there, yes, there was. I had, um, I had worked for the Associated Press in uh, Vietnam and Laos uh, during the war, and for a variety of reasons, then later as an editor in Hong Kong, for a variety of reasons, mostly family, family reasons, landed back in this area, grew up in Saratoga, landed back in Saratoga to help take care of my aging parents. Uh, needed a job to tide me over, tide us over. Um, applied to the uh, Gazette. Actually, I applied first to the Saratogian, suffered the, the awful humiliation of being turned down. I figured I was doing them a favor by offering them my services. They were not interested in the slightest. <laughs> Went to the Gazette. The Gazette happened to have an opening. Their uh, Rotterdam reporter had just submitted his resignation. Editor asked me if I thought I could uh, report on the town of Rotterdam for them. And I, I told him I was confident that I could. Uh, went home, got a map, looked to see where Rotterdam was, um, <laughs> despite having grown up in Saratoga. I don't think I had ever heard of it. And uh, Rotterdam turned out to be bad enough, uh, planning board meetings and you know, town budgets and all that sort of thing, local elections. But worse yet, uh, Rotterdam, the Rotterdam beat, for Gazette purposes, included Princetown and Dwaynesburg, rural towns in the you know, far reaches of the county. So it fell to my lot to report on the Princetown and Dwaynesburg uh, town boards as well. In Dwaynesburg, if anybody's ever been to Dwaynesburg, is just far and away the worst. If you've never been to a Dwaynesburg town board meeting, take my word for it, don't go. They are the most truculent people I had ever met. They seemed, this is before they got cable television. And the main form of entertainment seemed to be going to the town board meeting, I think it was once a month, if I remember correctly, probably a Wednesday night, and just argue and berate the town board members about anything. They had no business to transact. I would get the uh, copy of the agenda in the mail in advance, and I'd say, how in the world can you go out there and write a story about this? It would have to do with you know, increasing the town clerk's petty cash account by $5, and where the sand and gravel ought to be piled, whether in front of town hall or in the, in the back of town hall. 
And I go out there and figure this place is going to be empty. Nobody's going to be there because there's nothing of any consequence whatsoever on the agenda. I get there and the place would be packed. It would be standing room only. And they would be there and they'd yell, be yelling at the town supervisor and insulting them. And oh, it was, it was just dreadful. And I'd be sitting there with my notebook taking this stuff down in uh, deep despair. And um, to give you an idea, the tenor of their complaints. I remember the evening when uh, they were complaining about, uh, they, they would monitor the town employees, some of these grouches. There were these sort of backbench grouches in the town. And they had observed them taking a coffee break. Guys were out working with the snow plows and they timed them. They went into a diner, these guys. And he said, I forgot what the time was, but he said 15 minutes later, they were still in there. And somebody said, well, you know, they work very hard. They're up at 4 o'clock in the morning and, you know, long hours. They're cold. So, you know, they deserve a break. And the guy said, what are they, women? <laughs> just, to give you, just to give you an idea. <laughs> Remember the time, too, they'd yell at, they'd yell at the supervisor. They'd, in, they'd insult him. And I'd be sitting there with my notebook and you know, taking notes on this horrible stuff. And then one, I remember the night one of the guys, the guy doing the yelling, turned around and then he yelled at me. And he said, I hope you're getting this down. He said, I want to see this in the paper tomorrow. It was awful. What year was that? Early 1980s. Has it changed? I haven't been back since. I don't, I'm not going. When I left, I said, that's it. I'm never going back. The worst. The worst for me, the absolute low point came the night they were engrossed in discussion about how to paint the town garage roof. <laughs> and they were of two minds. There was one group, they, all, they, they agreed it had to be aluminum paint. But they, were, they disagreed over whether it ought to have fiber into it, as they framed it. And there was the fiber group, and there was the no fiber group. And they debated the cost. And this store has it for $17 a gallon, and that one has it for $20 a gallon. And how many gallons would it take? The only thing they could agree on was that the town supervisor would be ground man moving the ladder from place to place. The volunteers were, and this discussion went on and on. And I was close to slitting my wrists. I, I, I'm a journalist. How did, I, how did I come to this? How did I sink so low in my chosen career? It wasn't even my chosen career at that point. It was just you know, it was sort of the only thing I knew how to do to put food on the table. So I, I, I got back to the Gazette office, probably 9.30 at night, absolutely disgusted. Uh, no way, I said, I can turn this into you know, a conventional news story. And so I said to myself, the hell with it. I said, I'm just going to write it like it is. I'm not going to dress it up. I'm gonna, not going to make this into a conventional news story. I'm going to tell exactly what happened. And I did. And I quoted the supervisor. It's got to have fiber into it. Quoted the town councilman, say, no, it won't bind around the nails. You know, we painted it five years ago. Look at it and the price discussion. I put down all the details, who said what. And I did this in a spirit of absolute disgust. They're like, I'll show you. You want to do, you want to assign me to do stupid stuff? I'll write a stupid story. Stupidest story I ever wrote in my life. I submitted it and went home thinking they'd probably never put it in the paper. Well, they did because in those days, and even today, because that would put almost anything in the paper, just desperate to fill space. <clears throat> so they put it in just exactly as I wrote it. I picked up the paper the next morning. There it was. <laughs> Paint dilemma for Dwaynesburg. <laughs> With dilemma misspelled, a nice, a nice, a nice Gazette copy desk touch. I come in, I come in to work. The phone is ringing off the hook. People were calling up, saying it's the funniest story they'd ever read. <laughs> Town supervisor called up and he said he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Well, there was a revelation to me. I thought, you know, maybe I'm on to something. Instead of, you know, as I had been doing, trying to mold these stories into conventional news stories, if I just tell it straight, deadpan, and let the devil take the hindmost, maybe I can make a go of this. So after I, I left my job, after 25 years of writing the column, and I finally had an end to the book, I looked back and I could say to myself, with only a little bit of compression, that that was the beginning. That's sort of what got me going, and I began to relish it. I really did. I began to enjoy the job that I was previously kind of embarrassed about. And I set myself the task of just basically 
telling it like it is, without um, without decoration, without adornment, and I and my rise was absolutely meteoric. After that, I advanced from uh, Rotterdam to Schenectady City Hall, covering the glorious the, the glorious affairs of the Schenectady City Council. Um, even those of Mayor Frank Ducey, and a journalist at that time could hardly aspire to anything higher than covering, um, <laughs> covering Mayor, Mayor Ducey. <clears throat> I discovered the Schenectady Police Department, which turned out to be an absolute gold mine for me. Um, <laughs> Previously, the Gazette didn't really report on the police department. The Gazette reported, like all small town newspapers, reported crime. They reported what the police told them. Police says, you know, we arrested so and so for robbing a bank, so you report that. You take the police at, the word, at their word. You don't question them. And when I, <clears throat> I, I began to realize that the police department was very expensive, especially the cost of overtime was very high. And I wondered how that came about. And a couple of people said, well, because of the contract, it works this way and that way. And I said, well, can I see the contract? It never happened before <laughs> that anybody outside city government had ever tried to see the actual contract and read it. And it took me a long time, but I finally got hold of it. I think, you know, the corporation counsel's office had it, and they agreed to photocopy it for me or something, you know, 200 pages. I got hold of the police contract. It was just why I got so many columns out of that. It was just delightful, <laughs> explaining to the readers how they managed to you know, double their pay, how they managed to take off an average of 25 sick days each you know, per officer per year. And <clears throat> I remember the column I wrote you know, expressing concern about Schenectady being protected by such an unhealthy group of people. And <laughs> the reaction I got, the reaction I got was just was just marvelous, and I rode that I rode that beast as far as I could ride it, and um, you know through the throwing of eggs at cars, um, the uh, you know the rape of a female prisoner in the lockup, and um, I I thought I just you know I felt like a California 49er having struck a vein of solid gold. And one thing led to another. I finally got onto the teachers' union, which was worse yet, because if you think cops are a sacred cow <laughs> and ought to be respected, how much more so are teachers? I mean, nobody thinks ill of teachers. And to read, and to read their contract and report uh, how those things work, that was worse. The, the nice thing about the teachers was they wrote better letters than the, <laughs> than the police. Police wrote angry letters to the editor, but frankly, they needed a lot of touching up to make them suitable for publication. <laughs> Teachers were much better. Well, anyway, I can't walk you through. I, I mean, I got, I got 20 years of enjoyment out of this. Um, and some of the highlights which I discuss in the book are the, the trial of the two Albany Muslim men who were set up by the FBI, sort of the, the phony uh, terrorism case. The wonders of Steve Rossi, the school janitor who, <laughs> whose reign of terror in the Schenectady School District planned to get explosives on, where would you expect? You know, it had gotten to the point, if something like that happened in the police department, I would almost be prepared to say, well, you know, what do you expect? We, we've come, but in a school district, and nobody had ever heard anything, uh, anything like this, least of all me. The school district actually coddling this, um, this kind of homegrown terrorist. He kept bread on our table for a year, it must have been. He was, um, he was a delight. And then <clears throat> I say, after having traveled in our golden years uh, to various exotic places around the world, like, you know, Varanasi, the holy city of the Hindus on the banks of the Ganges, where Pearl almost died of asphyxiation just from the foul smells. Um, we we set, our, uh, set our minds on going to Jerusalem as tourists, mind you. I mean, we go at our own expense because that didn't, didn't pay my way. It was uh, strictly vacation. But, um, and I went uh, really quite innocently. Uh, Israel had, um, had interested me very little over the years. I had paid not much attention uh, beyond headlines, what everybody absorbs from the headlines. And my understanding, which I actually expressed to a couple of friends before I went there, and they asked me what I thought of things. I said, well, you know, you've got basically uh, two people contending for the same piece of real estate. You know, both people think it's, you know, by rights, their land. 
and there are probably you know, fanatics on both sides and probably blame to go around. And that was pretty much the extent of my understanding. <clears throat> and I got there, and it was, uh, it was really an eye-opener to me. We got to, um, we had been uh, introduced by some uh, Jewish friends in Niskayuna uh, who were members of the group J Street. If anybody has heard of that, it's a liberal, a, a more or less liberal group that, um, that works toward what is called a two-state solution, meaning you've got you know, the state of Israel, the Jewish state, and ideally alongside of it, you would have a Palestinian Arab state. They'd both be sovereign and they'd get along, and that's what they think, and many people think, ought to be, ought to be done. And this was all kind of new to me. I really didn't know much about it. But they introduced me to a Palestinian uh, friend of theirs, another uh, peace-minded um, man who's a westernized Arab who worked for the United States aid agency in Ramallah and spoke English as well as he spoke Arabic. And, and uh, due to uh, his uh, graciousness, we got to uh, tour the West Bank. We got to uh, see from afar some of the famous settlements. I didn't know what settlements were. I kept hearing, oh, Israel builds these settlements, and there's, that's a bone of contention. We got to see these settlements, you know, the barbed wire, the guard towers. We got to go th to our great dismay through some of the checkpoints, through one checkpoint in particular that Palestinian workers have to go through so as to get back into uh, Jerusalem, which was really a harrowing and a degrading um, a degrading experience. And we talked to uh, some Palestinian villagers about how they're not allowed to work in their olive orchards and not allowed to tend their trees because the army or the settlers will shoot at them. And all this was really quite stunning, was really quite stunning to me. And besides which, I have, anybody who's read my columns over the years, I don't know how many of you might, might have, but <clears throat> I, I have no, um, I really have a low regard for religion in general. Um, I've, I'll confess that up front, and those of you who are religious, I, I apologize, but I'm sorry. I can't bring myself to believe in supernatural beings. And I had ridiculed and gotten a lot of mileage out of ridiculing Protestant fundamentalism over the issue of creation and, uh, versus evolution. I had ridiculed the uh, Catholic Church over the canonization of this Indian maiden from the Mohawk Valley, St. Cattery, for allegedly healing a boy in a hospital bed out in Seattle 300 years after she had died. Um, I got a lot of mileage out of that. And I figured I had sort of established my uh, bona fides as an anti-religious bigot and, um, <laughs> and, and thought maybe I could get away with ridiculing uh, Judaism with equal uh, fervor. And I discovered that wasn't the case, that um, there are certain protections for various reasons that surround Judaism that don't surround Protestantism or Catholicism. But anyway, I didn't appreciate that fully. I went to the, we went, we spent quite a bit of time actually hanging around the Western Wall in Jerusalem, and many people find that a moving experience. Um, I didn't. Um, <clears throat> I agreed with, um, what was the scholar's name? Editor of the um, editor of the Hebrew Encyclopedia, his last name is uh, Leibowitz, a famous Israeli uh, scholar, who referred to the uh, doings at the Western Wall as religious disco. I thought that was an apt <laughs> phrase, and um, I had no more regard for that than I had. I mean, a serious regard for it than I had for the stroking and kissing of cows in Varanasi. I thought it was, you know, just so much exhibitionism and uh, wrote accordingly. And I wrote what I uh, saw and what I discovered about the Israeli treatment of Palestinians in the West Bank, which um, fairly appalled me. I was, I was disgusted not only with Israel, I was partly disgusted with myself for not having been aware of this. I thought, here I am in the news business, and even though I've not paid attention to anything but headlines, never done any serious study about Israel, still, why didn't I know <clears throat> what goes on there. Why didn't I know that the Israelis have gone in there and basically dispossessed the Palestinian Arabs of their land and continue to do that to, to this day? It was, um, it, was a, it was an eye opener to me, really an eye opener, and I wrote a couple of scathing columns about it. I wrote a couple of um, um, uh, sarcastic or sardonic columns about the um, religious disco at the Western Wall 
And as a result of those columns, a campaign was gotten up against me. I don't know if any of you are aware of this. You wouldn't know it from the Gazette because the Gazette naturally didn't report it. A campaign was gotten up against me uh, in Schenectady, led by a uh, local rabbi and joined by the owner of a certain supermarket chain uh, to, boycott, to boycott the Gazette, to cancel subscriptions and advertising. And <clears throat> without um, burdening you or myself with all the details, the upshot was that the Gazette forbade me to write any more on this subject and specifically to respond, not to respond to this campaign against me, which was immensely discouraging to me because I had really operated pretty much autonomously ever since, um, ever since reporting on the Dwaynesburg uh, garage roof uh, painting job. They'd really pretty much left me alone to write as I saw fit, which was wonderful. I mean, I had 25 great years out of it. And now to be told, you've got to knock it off. You know, you cannot respond to this. The, um, <clears throat> the Gazette management was called on the carpet for a private meeting between Gazette management and leaders, uh, certain leaders of the Jewish community uh, held at the headquarters of the Golub Corporation, just a few blocks down the street from the Gazette. And we, uh, I was not allowed to uh, write about this. The Gazette reported nothing about it. But this is where the Gazette was uh, dressed down, and after which I was um, not to write any more on this subject. Uh, in, the, in the past, including when I had reported extremely critically about the FBI and the U.S. attorney's uh, prosecution of those two um, uh, Muslim men set up for terrorism, the FBI and the U.S. attorney's office complained vociferously. They asked for a meeting at the Gazette, which they got, not for the first time. People who object to what we do frequently come in. They demand a meeting. They sit down with the editor, with you know, the management with a responsible reporter and have it out. And they denounce us and we respond. And uh, we have a photographer present. We take pictures of the event. We have a reporter present. And the next day in the newspaper, we have a story about what happened. Such and such a group came in yesterday and they said this and we responded that and here's a picture and here's an article. And that's the way it's done. In this case, it was not done that way. There was, <clears throat> it, it, that happened with the FBI and the US Attorney's Office. They came in and denounced me. Um, you know, personally, um, before the editor and the assistant editors. And we wrote about it, and I wrote about it myself. They denounced me, and I wrote a column about what they had said, and I wrote about what my response was, and that's how it's done. It was not done that way in this case. The Gazette kept absolutely quiet about it. No one was to know that this was going on, but I was not to respond. And uh, compressing events uh, somewhat, the upshot was after a few months, I was sufficiently discouraged uh, with this turn of events. And I was old enough to retire anyway that I packed it in and called it a career. Hence, the unlikely rise uh, beginning in Duanesburg and the awful fall of a small town newsman. I had the beginning, I had the end, and now I've got a book. Um, <clears throat> thank you for coming, Carl. Okay, thank you. Thank you.